So the recording uh, is for me to keep track of what we're doing and also to kind of secure a bank of data, but I was not really planning to use it at the beginning. Uh, now, I think that for the one who are participating, sometimes they want to hear again what has been said. So I'm happy to send it to only the one who uh, physically attended. And if they are requesting it, because not everybody wants it. So if you are live in our meeting and then want to have the recording, I send it to you. And then I'm not sharing that publicly anywhere. So it's not on my website. It's not definitely not on social media or on groups. But um, I'm not sending it to people who miss the live. It's not um, a backup solution if you cannot attend live. But I'm going to start to put it on a different social media because I've been creating a new project, which is uh, not on Facebook, not on Instagram. I'm going out of that. I've been starting a community on Patreon, which is more a system of membership. And when you join the Patreon, you actually, um, you really follow only what you want. You don't get any uh, unwanted thread or friend request or whatever. You just see the, yeah, the people that you are following through a membership. And this live, this recording will be available only for these people there. It's also a paying subscription with three different levels, starting at $8 per month to have access to that. Uh, so that's a way also to support my work, which I quite appreciate, mm -hmm. uh, and allows me to keep doing this free events, the monthly chats and something else coming up as well. And then for the people who want to go a bit further, uh, there's different level of subscription. So there's three levels. And then you can access to more data, more resources, group coaching. And the final one is, of course, the one-on-one -on -one coaching. Okay. So that's what I've been working on. And part of that, as I was saying, is also to create more free events. So keeping this monthly chat open for anyone, but only um, free only if you attend live. And uh, on, from the 11th to the 15th of July, I'm going to start a free five-day challenge. So really something simple and short and private. I try to keep things as private and confidential as possible mm -hmm. because um, I'm just honestly tired of social media. Um, why I took this topic again is because I realized that there's a lot of people sadly with MS who are really struggling with sleep and not only MS actually, it's becoming more and more general. And oh, I take my notes. Um, so especially with people with neurological uh, issues, sleep is really affected and it can be affected for many, many different factors that are MS linked most of the time, but can be also other one. So there's obviously the anxiety, depression, and thoughts that we're having during the night that can keep us awake. Uh, but that can be something more biological as well, like the di digestion process. It can be a question of hormones imbalance. So there's a lot, lot of factors that can affect sleep. Mm -hmm. Now, the way to fix this problem that are disrupting sleep uh, is sadly not a magic pill. It's not just one thing that's gonna sort the sleep and suddenly from insomnia, we're gonna have a full night sleep. Uh, that's really around having this whole body approach, whole body and mind approach that I'm already talking with the four pillars of health. So what can um, reset your sleep will be having the right nutrition. It's, it's having the right type of exercising or movement during the day, uh, so move. Um, that will be how you engage as well, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, all that that will actually make a whole that can help you have a better sleep. Now in my four pillars, sleep is in it as well. That means that sleep sadly is the problem, but it's also the solution. Sleep is crucial for health, for anybody. That's during sleep. We, well, sadly, sleep for a long time has been considered like um, not really, a bit worthless. Like I heard so many times, 
I will sleep when I'm dead uh, or sleep is for the weak. And that really makes me sad because it's so true and so wrong at the same time. Is that, I don't know if I can say that like that, if I can say it, but um, the fastest way and the easiest way to kill someone is actually to deprive this person from sleep. That's how important sleep is. So it is crucial, but it has been a bit put on the side like something not important. But sleep is what resets everything in the brain and in the body. That's really when we're having a process of detoxification. So all the toxins that we had through the day, again, emotional, mental, um, chemicals, that's when the body do is cleaning. That's when for the brain, it creates and consolidates memories. But right? it's really the housekeeping job of the brain about sorting data and filing, making room for the new days, the next days. Um, and yeah, controlled digestion as well. Like we could think about the stomach and intestine and all that, but the brain is really involved in that and everything happened during the night. A big part of it. So again, as I sleep is the solution for health, but it's also the problem. And we need this whole approach, whole body approach to sort it and reset the circadian rhythm. That doesn't mean that there's nothing we can do right now to support all this system while having a whole approach. There's still some strategies and things relatively simple to put in place to put ourselves in a way of resetting our circadian rhythm. I will talk more about circadian rhythm on the next sleep chat because I think it's a really fascinating uh, topic as well. We don't all have the same. And the idea by having these strategies that I'm gonna list is really to fund you on, understand when it's your time to go to bed and your time to get up. So let's go for the strategies. The first one for me is having seven to nine hours of sleep. So having this safe window. Um, again, I'm hearing a lot, a um, lot of people saying, oh, I can do with just five or four hours sleep and I'm fine. That's just not true. There's only, there's actually, I think, 3% of the population, world population that can do with less than five hours. So I don't really believe when someone's saying, oh, I'm fine with only five hours. <laughs> The ideal time is an average of seven to eight hours because that's the time we need to go through all the different phases of sleep, which is a fascinating subject as well, but I'm not going to enter into that. But all these different phases uh, have different lengths of 20 minutes, one hour, etc., And we need to go through all of them to have all the process that the brain is doing during the night, the cleaning, the detoxification, the digestion, etc. The sleep phase is really important that happen at the end of the night uh, to create the memories. So we need to go through all this phase and there's a certain time for all of this phase. If we doing less than eight or seven hours, we're missing some. It's not that they're getting shorter, it's that we literally skipping one, one of these phase. Mm -hmm. So I will say that the first strategy is, is to have a real good windows of nine hours, because we all know that it can take time to fall asleep. And mm -hmm. some people wake up a lot during the night, which is something that needs to be improved as well, that can be improved. But the safest way would be to have nine hours. Now I understand that nine hours can be a bit a lot for some people and hard with work, etc. But that's why I'm saying this window between seven to nine hours, it's the safest one. The second strategy is the regularity. It's going to bed every day at the same time, exactly the same times, and getting up exactly at the same times every day as well. Weekdays, weekend, holiday, it doesn't matter. We keep the same rhythm because that's the only way to reset the rhythm, circadian rhythm again, 
and the natural body clock that we're having. The brain needs to be trained and the only way to be to train a brain is to work on regularity. And then naturally the body and the brain will fall asleep. Now you might want to set a sleep time at 10 p.m. at night and get up time at 7 a.m. You might be working like that for a while and then you will realize that naturally your body or your brain want to start a bit earlier or start a bit later. That's the radio will be different for that. But starting by setting this regularity will help you to, yeah, to reset your circadian rhythm, simply. The third strategy is, is the exposure to light. Light is extremely important, but it has to be at the right time as well. So simply say it, the light, daylight, is the most direct and only way that the, the direct way to communicate with the brain. That's how the brain will understand that it's sleep time or daytime. So the best way to, again, work on resetting this circadian rhythm is to go outside early in the morning, have the bright light from the sun, natural light if possible, that will tell your brain and body that it's time to wake up to start the day. And actually the body will produce the right hormone, thanks to that, thanks to seeing the light, to um, yeah, get yourself into movements. So that will produce actually cortisol, which is a stress hormone, which is not always bad. We need it in the morning to wake up. And then the idea is to be careful in the evening as well to dim the light because again, dimming the lights and going to the dark slowly is another way to tell your brain, now we don't want cortisol anymore. Now we want melatonin, another hormone, which is the sleep hormone. And that's the only way the brain know which one to use or not. This problem of light in the evening, it's more problem in the evening than in the night, is that we're getting a lot of blue light, which are the same uh, frequency, frequencies as the sun in computer. Um, phone, all devices, uh, and the light that we're putting, um, yeah, just the light at home, the neon or whatever we're using, are disrupting us because it's not natural light, but they are acting on the brain the same way the sun will. Okay. So the ideal is to actually, well, for me, the idea would be to stop any light and device by 7 p.m. <laughs> But that can be a bit um, excessive. So there's technique around that. To, there's um, sunnies, sunglasses that help protect from the light. There's some um, screen that you can put on your uh, computer or your phone to protect as well. But uh, the best way is actually to follow the natural uh, sunlight. And when you see that it starts to get dark outside, starting slowly to get things darker at home as well. So the exposure to light was the third one. And then the fourth strategy is to think about your bedroom as a sanctuary. So that's a place you want to protect. And to protect and protect your sleep, you need the bedroom again, we talk about the light to be dark, it needs to be silent, and it needs to be cool as well. The thing with the temperature of the room is that the body, when we're falling asleep, naturally drops. The temperature of the body naturally drops. And of course, the, we feel the heat and we are unwell when there's a difference between the body temperature and the outside temperature. That's how we can have some night sweat or just not feel well. So we want to be warm before going to bed because that's what will put us asleep to be warm and comfortable. But then we need to go into a bedroom that is cooler because that will help us to have a better sleep. And then I will just add on this sanctuary of the bedroom, avoiding any type of disturbance. So yeah, any light, noise, uh, I know that for my case, I had a pussycat uh, 
jumping on my bed in the middle of the night. And I had to, yeah, find a way to minimize that as well. So that can be anything that coming in the middle of the night to disrupt the sleep. Number five is about the digestion. Um, so the strategy is to have your last meal between two and even better, three hours before bedtime. The brain is really, really busy during the night. You might think that it's doing nothing because we're sleeping, but no, it's actually extremely busy. It's actually more busy uh, sleeping than watching TV. That's how active the brain is during the night. And that's also the brain that control digestion. So what we want is actually to put the body in a relaxed mode, not to have too much to do. If we go through this phase of the first two to three hours of the digestion, that actually um, leave the burden on the brain to do all this other job about the detoxification and what's come at the end of the digestion actually. So we actually want the brain to be free for sleeping and do this cleaning job and not being busy doing digestion. Because something about the brain too that is quite fascinating is that multitasking is a myth. The brain can do just one thing at a time. So we don't want him to be busy with digestion when he's supposed to be sleeping and cleaning. The sixth strategy is to be active during the day, simply to be tired at night. Uh, so being active, we might be thinking, I need to exercise, I need to go out, I need to jog, etc. But it's not only the physical exercise, it's also simply keeping yourself busy during the night. I always talk about the mental, the emotional, the spiritual, etc. that are really important is just finding the right balance between doing absolutely nothing and watching TV and having a bit of activity, getting up, uh, doing things, going to do the shopping or reading a book. That's all part of being active. When you're active during the day, then you get tired at night. That's quite simple and easy to understand. Uh, now we have to be careful not to exercise just before bed because that will have the other effects of getting us too excited. And then it's gonna take more time to actually rest. So that's bringing me to the last and seventh strategy, which is for me, not the most important, but extremely important, is to have a wind down routine. Is to know what you can do in the night that will not be too demanding, but still relaxing to prepare you to go to bed, that will work as well as it's a routine or ritual, whatever you want to call it and do. Um, that's a way to signal to your brain, bread, to your brain, sorry, uh, that it's time to go to bed. It's a preparation. If you repeat the same or almost the same every evening, your brain will understand and your body will understand that, oh, she's doing that. It's time for me to calm down to relax because soon it's gonna be time to sleep. Of course, this wind down strategy, if we listen to the other uh, strategies that I've been sharing, that will not be watching Tilly or a movie that is a bit too, um, yeah, draining, too violent, too emotional. It's really something soft. Uh, so not being on device, not scrolling on social media. Um, but that can be also anything. That can be even just a beauty routine. That can be doing some um, crosswords or maybe not too engaging, but something to slow down. It can be a prayer, a gratitude journal. It can be a lot of different things. But having this ritual every evening will be the, set, the best way to reset yourself for a good night's sleep as well. So that was the seven strategies that I wanted to share.